I'm Alan Simpson, and this is the fifth of the climate emergency talks I've done for Nottingham University. Uh, and to this point that we need to be talking about greening everything. It's the fundamental basis of a different economics that might just allow us to survive, but also to find new ways of thriving and a better way of living. And, and some parts of the planet are already doing this in really inventive ways. And I think it's worth sharing the, the examples of this because they combine actions that are being taken at a national and international level, along with those that are able to be pioneered by localities and local communities. And somehow weaving those all together is, uh, is critical to creating a different economics, one in which both sustainability and social inclusion uh, become the heart of how we live tomorrow. So that's where we're starting. And where we go next is into what the sort of things communities are already doing and what we have to be doing. In terms of planting, we, we have to be looking at putting nature back into our own towns and cities, but it will be of a different form. The, the, many of those who are already working uh, in the sort of urban renewal uh, nature part of the, of the agenda understand that in terms of plantings, what we have to be considering is the planting of drought resistant trees and shrubs such that they are able to withstand both summer drought and heat waves uh, and the winter and spring or autumn uh, floods uh, and turbulent downpours that exceed the amount of rain that towns and cities and communities are having to deal with historically. So that's the the, the planting of what, what we plant and where we plant it is critical to the part of the rethink. It, it's also a huge value addition to the nature of the economy. If we do it properly, the estimate is that it's almost four billion pound a year that comes out of that as a gain. And even before you begin to account for the amount of carbon dioxide that is absorbed, the reduction of pollution that takes place and the role of urban cooling that uh, comes as part of the, the contribution. This is the part, an essential part of a new economics of well-being. Some places are already doing this. I think that the uh, example in Paris of the program of vertical gardens that the mayor has pursued is just outstanding. 100 acres of vertical gardens have already been put in place. These are being uh, mirrored by similar uh, initiatives in, in Milan with, with their Bosco Verticale, uh, and even in, uh, in parts of the UK where you see the opportunities to do the sort of vertical greening of urban landscapes and uh, and buildings, all of which is within our reach if we're just imaginative enough to step outside the conventions that all we have to do is to produce a building that looks good, but doesn't necessarily contribute anything to cleaning up the environment as it goes along. But this can begin at university levels as well. And I say that in the comfortable surroundings of Nottingham University, um, but also knowing that in Tamasat University, they have begun to convert parts of the university campus uh, into not only a green roof, but a tiered layer of organic green space for, for organic gardening. And we need to look at this fantastic amount of green space that um, universities have on their campuses and ask ourselves, well, where are the partnerships with local food growing communities? Where's the use of those landscapes to develop an inclusive approach to urban uh, renewal, such that we re-green uh, and socialize the process of re-greening re our towns and, and cities? And you know, the, the contribution of to food production in that process 
cannot be ignored, if only because it will be needed to provide new bridges that connect university campuses with the communities that tend to surround them, but often get overlooked by them. In other parts, you have a different, much simpler approach to Green in Montréal. They have a, a fabulous initiative being taken by the local authority, um, which provides for pavement planting. And they create space around the base of trees, about a meter either side. The local authority provides the sort of choice of, of flowers and shrubs for people to plant in, you know, around or in front of their, their own properties. Um, and a series of little signs um, that just give some degree of social ownership of the re-greening process. I love the one which just says, Fet comme chez nous made, like our home. And I th think that the more that households at the level of the street and the community are part of the process of, of re-greening urban environments, the stronger that will be in the reclaimed culture that will place an importance on that rather than just the concretization that has taken place over the last few decades. No less important is the creation of car-free streets to enjoy them. And, and this again, if you're going to re-green, you just take pollution out of the process. And the ability to have zero carbon local distribution networks, local non-fossil uh, non fuel taxi services and delivery services, all of this is running a pace around North America and Northern Europe. Uh, and there's this, in a sense, is the essence of tomorrow's economy and not one that is still locked into a fossil fuel mindset, which creates dependencies on precisely the sort of drugs that are taking us into the problems that we have constructed for ourselves already. So the alternatives are out there. We just have to reach out and pull them and share on the basis of just copying all the best of what already exists and maybe coming up with one or two ideas of our own to add to what is worth sharing between us. One example of this for me is the fantastic example in Rotherham of the River of Flowers. And they just decided that all the major routes into the city would become uh, places for nature. Uh, and they sort of have wild flowers and seeds that are planted there. They're great places for pollination. Uh, they are supportive environments for wildlife and insect life. And they add beauty to the notion of how we make our way into the towns and cities that we have. Incidentally, they always also apparently save the local authority about £15,000 a year um, because they are self-sustaining. And those are now being mirrored in Sheffield, Glasgow, Swindon, Liverpool, Wokingham, Birmingham, and goodness knows how many other places. And there's no reason at all why they shouldn't be everywhere. That's the key, that actually it is within easy reach for us to re-green almost everything not that moves, but that doesn't move in order to put nature back at the center of, of a more sustainable economics. In that context, it's worth also understanding that Copenhagen is planting fruit trees in the streets so that everyone can enjoy the produce that comes from them. And it's not just beauty, but it's also where we will get our fruit and vegetables from in the future. We're gonna to have to think those through in the context of urban environments. No less important um, as the emergence of the Miyawaki forests, which are tiny urban forests um, that are planted where, where trees are, are diversely planted very close to each other with rates of growth that are five times the normal rate of growth, but they can be put in very small pockets of places at a neighborhood level can be squeezed into school playgrounds or alongside roads, <clears throat> but all of which then actually build in an intensity of the 
putting the imposition, re-imposition of nature back into the available landscapes and spaces that we have to make use of it. This is just harnessing inventiveness and creativity uh, in ways that put nature at the center of an economic program rather than there as an afterthought. Madrid, and on a different scale, is planning a huge forest belt around the whole city. And I you know, look at, at Nottingham, it's famous for its Sherwood Forest outside in the north of the county. But it could do that with the, around the city itself. What if we were to, to come up with a plan that surrounded the city with this, this uh, ring of trees that breathe, breathe life back into the urban environment? We could even call it Nottingham Forest. Well, it, maybe not that that wouldn't go down with Notts County supporters, but for forest supporters, it would. And for those who lived within the notion of the forest environment, it would send a different message out about how we want to live, have to live much more in harmony with the nature that we are fundamentally dependent on for our own survival. And in doing that, we have to redefine growth. Can we do it? It has to be one of the biggest lessons that we unashamedly seek to learn from parts of the developing world. Often I hear the argument that all this is fine and good, but it's not affordable and it's not doable on a scale um, and, and it's not economically justifiable. Growth in conventional terms is now part of the problem. Productivity is a notion is part of the problem because both of those ignore the consequences of the waste that comes uh, as part of the process and whose responsibility it is to clear up and reprocess that waste. It's always been palmed off on other succeeding generations who will be presumed to have a better idea on how to clean up today's mess. Well, we, we can't kick the can down that road any longer. To cut our carbon emissions by 10% a year, we have to be doing the process of repairing our environment and repurposing our economy now. Uh, and that means redefining growth. And for me, what put this in context for the developing world, from the developing world, for the developed world, is the example of Uttar Pradesh, where they planted uh, a million trees in using 800,000 volunteers, sorry, 50 million trees, using 800,000 volunteers in a single day. Uh, and I have been absolutely flabbergasted by that achievement. Uh, I was taken aback even further when I discovered six or seven months later that their neighbors in Andhra Pradesh actually surpassed them. They planted 65 million trees using a million and a half volunteers uh, in 12 hours. Now, if the poorest on the planet can do that, why is it that those of us in the richest parts of the planet aren't doing anything similar on a scale that would take responsibilities for cleaning up our share of the mess, which is the greater share of the mess in terms of carbon emissions that are being responsible for in the West uh, and actually leading by example. We're in this embarrassing position where the world in the cleanup process is probably being led by the poorest and not by the richest. And it seems to me that if I go back to what I pointed out in one of the earlier talks about this sort of glass that shows that 50% of the carbon emissions are currently uh, incurred by the top 10% of wage earners and the lowest 50% of earners on the planet are responsible for about 10% of the emissions. Well, we have to turn that upside down and maybe compulsory community service by those at all levels, and particularly those at the top of the tree, involves putting back more than they're taking out, with them we're all taking out. And that becomes a benchmark of active citizenship 
from which rights and entitlements are also conferred. And if we do that, not only will we clean up the planet and the air and the soil and restore the soils that we depend on, but we'll end up feeling better about life and ourselves. That's what we have to do.